Welcome to the Use and Designer Speaker Series with Billy Blue College of Design at Torrens University. Today we're speaking with Design Director Alex Zabotto Bentley from AZB Interiors. Welcome, Alex. Thank you very much. That was a mouthful. Well it done. It was a mouthful, but there's I mean, a lot of design in there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Drop the word design 2,000 times. And clearly you're all about design. Alex, tell me about where you started. Where did you study your first degree? Well, I guess, you know, I was incredibly interested in design. I was that kid that would, instead of spending my money buying Tracks magazine, I'd buy World of Interior magazine when I was 10. So I was like going through that understanding design. But fortunately enough, I was much more interested in branding at that point. And so when I went to university, I studied um, behavioral science and I became a branding specialist at the same time and concurrently I was doing set build designs I learned all about construction spatial design at different colleges throughout my summer courses and developed a very very strong interest and love of design from there I became a um, I worked for different firms as you know I was doing set building I was a stylist for many years I then worked at Vogue Australia as a men's fashion director with, with all of the, my interests, it, I started developing a, a, a clientele that were very interested in my perception or my perspective on branded environments. And so from then, I just started designing branded yeah. environments. Isn't that interesting? Because the psychology of design is incredibly important. And I Absolutely. think that's something that, um, that I think that there is an element of the design world today that actually forget about that, is that people have to live in the space yes. and it is about reading the person that you're actually designing for. So psychology, psychology is incredibly important. But what, what gave, you, you mentioned about you had different interests in, in spatial awareness and different things as you grew up, but what gave you the direction to study the course that you did? I think I felt at that time when I was young that I was gleaning a lot of information and developing my knowledge. I just needed to understand my the base understanding of why people are motivated or why people connect to environments or why people feel different in a room that's a particular shape or a particular colour. So the, the psychology of the consumer became something that was, you know, very robust in my thinking. And it's interesting that a lot of people that work with branded environments don't also have concurrently this love of interiors. Mm. I had this love of interiors and so I was matching it with interiors. So I'd work for example like Westfield and I'd work with their branded dining experiences and talk about the colour that people feel, what colour would inspire you to eat, what colour would inspire you to drink, what colour would motivate you to stay in a food court rather than walk right through. So I, I learned all of that information and then I started to apply it to interiors and then I loved interiors so much that interiors became huge for me and it became my bread and butter my career but partnered with that was my absolute understanding of the psychology of the consumer i love your passion that's coming through in the conversation that's included i do a lot of that that's clearly why we've yeah. included you here today yeah. because you you have done some amazing projects yet i you, the way you've defined what you specialised in, I think, was, was, was very, um, very secure for somebody yeah. of your age. We're age neutral here, by the way. We don't talk about age. But I'm happy you to, didn't no. study yesterday. You studied a few years ago. Yeah. And what advice would you give to people that are wanting to choose a career path in design today? Because there is so much choice out there, yeah. so much choice yeah. to deliver the passion that you're talking about. Yeah. There's a few things. I think number one is intuition. Intuition, this love of something, when you love something and you can dedicate your life to it, you will become a success. So if you love fashion, you can become a success and be focused on fashion. But because we're human, we have multiple loves. We have multiple challenges, multiple interests. Bring those along the journey. Make sure that you're, you're the, the disciplines that you focus on are almost mutually exclusive because at some point they'll come together for you. So you could love footy and cars but you could and design, but you don't separate them all, love them independent, and then ultimately something's gonna happen and some magical by some magical moment they'll be immersed forever and you could be the first designer of 
the best looking car for a football team or something, I don't know. But I think the important thing is not to limit yourself to one, one field, mm. reading, researching, get off Pinterest, mm. learn about things. Interesting. Go, Why do you say that? Well, I actually, uh, you know, I wrote a really interesting article just recently for Huffington Post about the, the deep Pinteresting of, of Pinterest. I'm dispinterested because I just find that it's a very shorthand way of designing. Um, and, you know, as a design director of a, you know, a really successful company now, I'm really happy with our direction. I have students that come to me and, they, and I say, give me a project. Show me your project. I want to know what you think. And more often than not, I can definitely tell that they've gone to the first four pages of Pinterest. Like, if you're going to fool me, go rabbit warren deep. But Pinterest is not... It's re Pinterest is great if you want to look at a colour or an application. But, you know, people that want to reference, you know, 1940s Italy hotels, go back into the 1940s, research that hotel, find out who the architect is, who the designer is. I mean, especially even, local, even now, doing modern, motivational, incredible environments, look at around the world. Don't look at Pinterest. Look at what is a successful business in that environment. So they're designing by influence, not by passion, which is clearly what you're about. Is Absolutely. Oh, and being intuitive and also being very well researched and well versed. The amount, of, the amount of students now that I see that are passionate about what they love but can also express themselves is very different to how it used to be because 15 years ago we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have super fast internet. Now there's no excuse. And there are some students that are in design that are just brilliant because they go far and wide hunting. Yeah. Alex, what was some, what, what's something that your education didn't teach you for the real world? I think being um, malleable, you know, my education said that people are a certain way and when you get into the workforce, people are never that way. No brief is clean cut. So what prepares you for that? It's, I think it's being someone that really communicates. To be creative, sometimes you communicate through your actions or your art or what you do with your hands or what you do typing. And I think it's important to talk about that with your peers, to be, to challenge what you do, to communicate back with them, make sure that people understand you. And do you understand what I mean? Yes. You know, I studied psychology. I studied behavioral science. I studied the behavior. I still, when I went out into the workforce, I was still a bit like, lucky I was, you know, a very chatty Italian guy or kid. I, I was able to communicate, but I could find other people were finding it very difficult to translate their knowledge into reality. So you were fortunate you had a cultural background that allowed you to be that person as well as your education. But, but moving on from that, what are, some of the, what are some of the, I guess, the projects you're proud of that you've actually worked on? Um, I think... I'm, I look, I'm just incredibly proud. Last year, we, we worked on a, a restaurant called Milner in Sydney, and it was, it's an underground restaurant that was heritage listed. It was an old tobacco factory. The owner was a Viking of Viking blood, so I designed a luxe Viking restaurant for him in Sydney. Underground, it was a barren, wasteland cellar of a building and I turned around and created this really really defined very beautiful space and we won the New York Design Awards for it. Tell me about for, that. So, I, so how do you win that? You actually do, you don't actually apply for it which is interesting, interesting enough. Um, we, were, we were told that we were finalists and then I had to write a brief on what, why I wanted to create that space. And, you know, our, our projects that we do are very layered. Our, our hospitality projects are very layered. My belief is that the story has to unfold. Can I just recap it a little bit, just, just here? This, a, this Italian bloke from Melbourne yeah. is actually won a New York Design Award. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool, man. Yeah, it's not even just an Italian guy from Melbourne, an Italian guy from 
the wrong side of the tracks in Melbourne, like elbowing my way past gangs so I could get my soft serve ice cream. And they're like, pff, pff. but um, <laughs> fended for myself, made it through. Um, and my whole crew in Coburg are very proud of me. So it's just really good. Awards aside, you know, gratification comes from having an incredible team. And, you know, we very, we're very heavily committed to communication and very heavily committed to working very closely with our clients and really having a really strong, potent relationship with them and their projects. And I think that's kind of translates very well in, I mean, we've worked on a project called Sea Deck, which is a, an Egyptian ship that we trawled to Australia and transformed it into something that could be sort of traveling down the Nile in the 1920s. We did a restaurant called Kitty Hawk in Sydney, which is beautiful and it's, everything was custom made. I wanted everything to be custom made. So we work, we're very, we pride ourselves on trying to work with local Australian artists, local makers, small run factories around the world, designers that actually are not revered or, or understood yet, like lighting designers and people that may have had their heyday 20 years ago and we sort of bring them back in. So in one project, there was a, a French carpenter that hadn't worked for 15 years and someone connected me with him and he designed an 11 metre bar for me and it was his favourite project. He hadn't worked for 15 years and he was just hand chiseling, like things like that, craft and understand. We custom, we did a mosaic, I designed a mosaic and it's 44,000 pieces of tessera hand on two beautiful environments that are they're not that detailed, but they're more about the just being slick and perfect and, and you know, they're a beautiful brand environment from intercontinental restaurant called Piccolina to we're just working, doing Aesop restaurant in Bangkok to doing villas and hotel projects in Bali. So your brand is clearly international. I love the way yeah. that you, you, you have an international air about you, clearly. But it's the I guess, is there, <laughs> and you do that very well. Very well. Can I just say also that, is there, is, there, is there an influence or a designer that influences you, the, I wouldn't say the most, but is there a designer that influences you either locally or abroad? I think there's a, there's a group of designers out of New York, originally from LA, called Roman and Williams, and they're ex-set builders, husband and wife team. They worked on film as production designers, very much like my background. They understand the theatrics of interiors, but they also understand how to under-design so that there's... What do you mean by under-design? Under-design is, it's not all custom shop built cabinetry. It's a source table that has history. There's something that's old and lost and found and gleaned from like a thrift shop, but put into an environment that's, you know, very top end. Um, I love their work. I, I, I really love, I, I don't like to pinpoint who I love. I love art, I love artists, I love colorists, um, I love architects and sculptors. I'm the guy that goes and spends two days in New York looking at 1984 Keith Haring original graffiti art that's lost in subways and forget the big interior design cafes because I'm so focused on that story for myself. Alex Zabotto Bentley is clearly passionate and, and incredibly creative. Is Alex ready to reveal or has he had any failures? I think with every project there's some level of disappointment in some instance. I'm, you know, I'm very particular about things. I, you know, if it's a particular blue, it has to be that blue and, and everyone's like, oh, he's killing me. And I make them do a paint sample 25 times on a wall. But so I get those small disappointments until it's a huge success. Are they your disappointments or the clients? They're not disappointed. Um, I just, I really, really, really make sure that I am very client friendly. I become very close with my clients because I share their vision. I understand where they're from. I want the same outcome as them. I respect why they've engaged me. I respect that they've selected me because of my taste level. So it's me that is accountable. 
So I would really always try to present back to them what I feel is the best we can do. There are times when you know, other people have let me down or things haven't arrived the right way, but you know, that's, kind of, that's human nature, you can't have perfection. And I think that imperfection is something also to be proud of, like you know, rolling with the punches sometimes, being able to make sure that if something's not right, that you make it right and you change it so it's the best it can possibly be. With, with social media today, we're all overwhelmed with all sorts of design events going on around the world. But, but predominantly we have New York Fashion Week, we have Met Gala, we have Milan Design Week, yeah. we have all these design shows. Where does fashion meet interiors or does it? Wow. Um, where does it? Uh, I think, or, or does it? I th no, I th of course it does. And I think, I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't just say fashion and interiors. I'd say fashion, music, you know, anything tactile, art. You know, art meets interiors, art meets fashion. It's the, these elements that were so separate, or I called it before mutually exclusive, they existed separately. They had their own energy. So they orbited around each other, but they never touched. Now, everything's a crossover. You know, from, and you know, I think it's the art of the collaboration, the respect of the collaboration, where for many years, if you were to collaborate with someone, it would lessen your power. Now, collaboration is key. To collaborate not only amplifies what you do, it gives you a, a greater cachet because you're able to connect with someone different, with a different audience. So the best collaborations are the ones that are kind of highly unexpected. And those unexpected collaborations are the ones that get the most amount of social media. Because people are like, how the hell did they do that? Absolutely. Like for example, <laughs> best collaboration of yeah. the moment. Yeah. Gucci has just collaborated with Dapper Dan, and Dapper Dan is a New York Harlem-based designer who used to, in the 80s, take Gucci bags, cut them up, make them into jackets, and sell them to people like Salt and Pepper in the Push It film clip. And then that guy was sued by Gucci for misuse of the brand. Yeah. Now Gucci have employed him, and they've, so it's like, you would never have thought that they would do something together. And all the couture brands have to reinvent themselves to some degree, don't they? Well, they have because, to, and I think it's getting faster and faster. Yeah. Like, also, you know, like Vuitton working with uh, Jeff Kuhn, but even more, more ridiculous and crazy is working and getting the rights to using like the Mona Lisa and adapting the Mona Lisa to use it in, in their handbag. Like, you know, that's art and fashion. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy, but... The, the notion of that collaboration is getting faster. Yes. It's also getting faster, but it's also, it's hitting its tipping point because brands like Supreme, where they've collaborated with everybody, yes. like from toothpaste to condoms, to underwear, yes. to everything. It's kind of, it's hit that point, that tipping point. And the tipping point is when all the energies just converge to this moment and everyone's going, yeah, running for it. And then it just goes, so it's, 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 it's design, holistic, it's a holistic design, which is really what you're about, AZB Creative, which is why we're so fortunate to be able to talk to you as well. Mm. But one of the latest projects, and I find this a little bit outside the square, is you're now working on a gym fit out as well, which, I mean, the gym industry is, is, is it's so competitive these days. Oh, well, hang on. So I don't like to call it a gym. Like, this is a lifestyle enhancing environment. So are we talking fashion, are we talking design, are we talking exercise, what are we talking about? It's, well, it is, in its purest sense, it's a branded environment. It's an environment that allows the consumer to connect with. So it's a brand that, you know, there's these environments, hypothetically a gym, they're everywhere. But this particular project is custom created with the client needs in mind, not the gym's needs. It's like time poor, 
quick workout, respect in, in an interior and an environment that allows them to feel like it's like a New York loft that becomes a gym. So it's like a private environment. It feels like someone's home. Is it like a, is it like a, hot, a gym within a small hotel? It just has these trappings of familiarity or it connects people back. And then their, then their language with their clients it's, there's a very succinct difference to their language that uh, allows people to engage back with them. To me, it's genius. So what is the gym? Yes, yeah, so it's and called Corno. Point? So this, this product and this, this, this company, the whole manifesto is about removing all of those negativities with the gym, removing everything that says, we're better than you. We're gonna tell you what to do in a way that is over an hour, like you, and we can only do it at this particular time. And so, so all these things that they've looked at that, that have scared people away or make people distant, they've connected them back. So in your design world, what have you interpreted? What was the brief and what did you deliver? Yeah, so the brief, the brief is an, to create an environment that is, that allows the the members and not just the members remember a lot of the time it's not just members that enter it's people that are interested in coming into a gym environment or coming into a lifestyle enhancing environment people are interested but then when you walk in and it's the, you're confronted with the gym it's instantly the everything relating back to what so it's color it's spatial awareness yeah so, it's so what we design what we space. is yeah is mm. An entrance, uh, an ent so it's the materiality. It's defocusing on things that are gym-like and making it more like personal environment-like. So things, raw timbers, uh, verdant living green elements. Um, we've changed the notion of the counter. So there's no hard-faced counter, so there's no confrontation. It's, you know, using Things like Soho House in New York and Apple Shop. You know, there's, they're just, with, it's really interesting having open legged tables mm. instantly and someone not sitting behind a desk looking at you. Mm. Someone's just, they're just doing their thing. Mm. And you just happen to walk in and they go, hey, just come and join me. You're sharing a space with them. So you have high and low tables. We, I was, we were, in the conversations, we were saying, I know my female friends want to just hang out after they train. Mm. But a lot of gyms have sofas. Mm. If you've just trained mm. and you're in your gym wear, you want everyone to look at you. You want to look good, so you want to lean up and you want to, you want to elongate your body. <laughs> Guys and girls the same. Uh, you have to think about that. No are you one's trying to tell me vanity is associated with a gym? Pardon? Are you trying to tell me vanity is associated with a gym? Clearly, yes. Yes. <laughs> Corn Iron stands for uh, health and wellness throughout our lifestyle. So one of our, our key taglines is, you know, Corn Iron Life. So we incorporate health as a big element uh, into our life and we understand how hard it is or challenging it is for people to actually try and remain healthy, whether it be through nutrition or physical exercise in this case. So uh, through design and through the assistance of Alex, we were really excited to, to engineer a model that was able to remove a lot of those barriers for people to conduct uh, some physical exercise. And walking into the gym, I mean, we can see here the colours, I mean, the green and the black is, is quite a direct contrast, but there's something about that, there's something that draws you about that colour, the green. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of thought put into it, and we wanted to incorporate, uh, you know, the outside world into the inside. So coming from a, a place of adventure, uh, I love the outdoor sports and, and everything I do in the wilderness. So we wanted to take those elements, everything from, from smell um, to the greenery, uh, we wanted to incorporate that into the club, so hence you'll see you know, nice soft palette tones, you'll see the greens come through, because there's a feeling of you know, nature that we experience outside. You know, we want to incorporate that and, and bring it inside. Now the concept is that there are nine stations which we can see sitting behind us here. That's the, I guess that's the core platform to each of the gym outlets, is that correct? Correct, that's the main model, so it's, it's very systemised and it's very uh, scalable to each individual as well. So because we've got good quality control over the whole model, uh, that allows us to adapt and work in with individuals or small groups or larger groups as well quite easily. Sure, sure. 
Craig, with the with the design fit out, I guess you clearly want to represent what your competitive edge is in the market, correct? Uh, it wasn't about having the competitive edge. Right. It was more so about um, how do we offer value to our clients and how do we get them moving. Our aim is to touch as many senses as possible. Everything from smell to, to what you feel through textures and through the help of you know design guys like Alex at comes with amazing experience. That's not my forte, this is my forte. So yeah, we wanna to touch as many um, senses as possible. So when they come in, they wanna feel invigorated, they wanna feel the energy, they wanna smell it, they want the clean air. So, you know, that was part of the brief we, we put forward to Alex is like, let's let's encompass all this together. You've obviously got your own secret recipe, if you like. Correct, yes. Online yep. represents. So uh, I guess there's some of that you want to keep to yourself and maybe some you want to share. But I guess what what is it about a space like this that, that you think that members really do need? What, what's, go, what's going to attract them to come in on a regular basis? Because that's really what you want. You want that, that commitment, don't you? I think it's, uh, there's, a, there's a few elements to it where it's, it's one thing attracting them, but it's, it's one thing, uh, the other being the experience. Out there in the world, there is just so much going on that we're desensitised to a lot of it. And so we've got a lot of blinkers on, or we've got selective hearing, you've got these digital devices. So there's always these sensors that are not engaged. So when you come into the Core 9 facility, let's engage, you know, what, what's the music going on? So that creates emotion and feeling. And then you know, what do they smell when they walk in? What do they see when they walk in? What do they touch and feel when they walk in? Um, so bringing the sensors alive through design and then you know, combined with the physical product and the workout, guys just walk out feeling a million dollars. I must say, it's great to see design in an industry like the fitness industry. Uh, it shows that it's been taken to another level. Alex has done a sensational job and we've seen awesome. the concept and yep. it's great to um, be involved in the concept to, um, I guess, take it to our audience and appreciate the fact that uh, the gym industry is alive and well. It's exciting times ahead. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Thanks very Thanks. much. Thanks okay. for having me. So it's reading the client, it's understanding what the client wants, it's understanding the psychology of, of, of I guess, uh, the person coming into a space yeah, of design, yeah. etc. With with the influx of social media, which is it, it's just it's overwhelming these days. I mean, and it, it is so accessible. What do you think is uh, particularly important in the experience of design? Um, it's an amazing question because you know the for many years, you know, experience was not the number one thing. It was the design or the, you know, the create the space, make it look funky and crazy. Da, 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 da. But it was about more about the, I like to call it facadism, more about the surface. The reality is we, are, we live and breathe and feel more now. We connect more now. We want to connect. Do you, so think, the do you, do you think we connect more now? We want to. So do you the, think we do? I think we, I think we, we, I'm well, not saying me, I think generally we that. are more disconnected. Mm -hmm. So when we go into an environment, we, people sit on phones, sit on tablets, sit and look, they're happier in their own space. They will get Uber Eats, they will sit on their whatever, they'll do whatever. They will do everything in their power not to be social. But when they do, they want to connect. Mm -hmm. So the experience of design, in my mind, is to make sure that when that person has left their tablet and left their home, that they're gonna connect with me. And me is my client. So if my client is a gym or a lifestyle environment, or if my client is a food experience, a bar, a hotel, a restaurant, I want them to pick me. And it's not about what it looks like, which it is of course, because I'm an aesthetic and an aesthete, it's about what they feel when they walk in that door, what they smell, what they touch. Like when you touch, that's tactile, that feels natural. When I sit down, it's not too low, I don't feel slumped, I'm sitting higher. Or I can stand up and lean against something that isn't gonna to be too cold and stainless steel. It's warm, it's natural. I look around my room, it feels like, is it someone's library or someone's home? Is it a loft? Am I connecting? But like things like that, that you're thinking about them, not about you. Yes. If you think about the customer, the consumer, experience in design is paramount. Mm. And when, if you don't think about that at the beginning, you've totally missed the point. What do you think some of the biggest 
mistakes people make with colour are? With colour? Yeah. I think it's really interesting. It's, uh, I just actually had this conversation a few days ago about uh, mon what monochromatic is. And we're saying how we, we are really drawn to a big potent colour in a monochromatic environment. It's because monochromatic, we see things, we just, we just forget about it, we do it light and dark shadow, and a monochromatic colour, bang. It's like, so it, that's great as for a brand. When you're in an environment, you need to, colour is, is, the, is the one of the most important things that's gonna change your perception within a nanosecond. If you walk through a, blue, a green, calm environment, like a sage green environment, it softens you. If you go into a lime, bright environment, it actually motivates you, it energizes you. Same thing with like, you know, I used to talk um, with magazine editors about the covers of magazines and why a lot of magazines use the color blue. Because the color blue and models with blue eyes, and they match the eyes of the models to the color of the magazine, you are instantly attracted to a blue eyed, you want to, you want to pick that, you feel like you want to become friends with that magazine. And it's a great selling point. So color and harmony, understand, I mean, color is one thing. I think the bigger thing is the two colors that work together, the energy of two colors. So when you put a color against another color together, you can do something and no one will enter that space or it, it vibrates in a way that allows you to definitely come the way you're saying it because color has energy and people it's about and, energy. and people feel that when a room is not right or there's a space that's not right it's because the colors are not working together yeah, yeah very important what's your theory on color in a small room light or dark so my firm belief is if you're in a small room you go dark because and it's, a, it's against a lot of other people's principles, but in a darkened room, you have infinity. In a, in a white room, you, it's finite. White room casts shadows, dark rooms don't. Because normally people would think the opposite. That's right. And those yeah. people are wrong, trust yeah. me. Yeah. What about- Ring me um, and complain, <laughs> but I'll stick. One of your biggest residential design successes. I'm actually working on a a villa project in Bali, which is a very interesting project because it's, um, it's an existing building that's a modernist building on the beach. And I thought, how can I make this a totally next level experience? So what I decided to do was bring it right back to the bare bones. You've gone modernist in Bali, I've gone Malibu. Yeah, exactly. It's that. It's, it was Malibu, <laughs> which is like, ugh, I hate. So I stripped it back. And my brief to myself and what I told my client is, imagine if this place has been overrun by plants for 50 years and then we've just opened the door. And so everywhere it's plants grown. So we've, we've created Narnia. This, environment yeah exactly so we instead of we've removed solid walls and introduced growing vines as vertical walls so we've removed certain walls so you're literally in this ever-growing verdant rich environment that's green and living and one of the things is because if it's living and if a large percentage of the structure has greenery on it it's forever evolving so it grows. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. So it's bringing three nature, years bringing in the nature into interiors, that yeah. whole connection of two. Yeah. What about one of your biggest commercial successes? I think actually there's a really beautiful project in Melbourne called Greenfields, um, which was the old Albert Park Lake Golf Club. And it was this really sort of daggy burger, big warehouse. And I wanted to reimagine sort of dining halls in Barcelona and big sort of sheds in Morocco. And so we just gutted it, knocked every wall out and just custom designed our own tiles, encaustic tiles called sticks. And it looks like a whole lot of sticks on the ground. So we did like 400 square meters of these beautiful tiles and all these soft hues and then did gigantic casement windows around it. So it's just 
this enormous, beautiful warehouse on the park. And it is loved. It's like the Instagram, most Instagrammed venue in Melbourne. It's beautiful. So, Alex, final word to final word. our audience, up and coming designers. What, what, what's your final word, your, your, your mentor advice? Trust your gut. Like it's about you, no one else. You are the director of your life. If you want to go somewhere, if you want to travel the road less traveled, if you want to be super niche, do that. But also find things that are kind of the opposite of it to make sure that you're balancing really strange things at the same time because it keeps your mind agile. It makes you research things that you never, like pick a subject and hunt it down, get a painter, understand everything about that painter, be well researched. I struggled, it was very, very hard at the beginning. I was just trying to do something that no one did. And I knew that one day someone would hear my voice and I knew that and I was really adamant that, you know, what, I just didn't want to end up like a soccer playing Italian kid from the Burbs. I just wanted to really make my mark and my, uh, the only way you can make a mark is to be yourself. And, you know, luckily I was able to ride it out, ride those days when there was no money, but then people started really understanding and connecting with what I had to say. And, you know, ultimately, you may not be rich, and you, but you are rich in experience and rich in your, your life becomes rich. Or you can be rich, actually. Anyway, my, as I flash my Gucci watch. <laughs> Alex Zavato-Bentley, thank you for sharing yourself today. Absolute pleasure. Today, thank you very much. Thank okay. you.